Wait, it's, it's the afternoon. Is it nearly beer o'clock? Wait, who's got beer? Ooh. Ooh. Beer o'clock. I think we should talk about industrial controllers instead of beer. Alright, okay. That's it's not quite as exciting as beer, but you know. No, no, it's exciting. exciting. Industrial controllers are used to make beer. True. It is. Very See? important. Oh, very important. Why don't we have a brewery? Ah, oh, next year. Next year. We'll make beer next year. Industrial controlled beer. Now, the backbone of any industrial process controller, these things, these are programmable logic controllers. They're like super reliant industrial control switches. These are really old ones, these are seen as S5s, but you still see them out there. But this selection of gear is bang up to date and represents what you'll actually find out there in the real world. Now, programmable logic controllers are the backbone of our nuclear control industry. Production lines, making things like cars, water purification is all controlled by PLCs. Pharmaceuticals, drugs, medicines, those production lines that make our medicines are managed and controlled by PLCs. Even wind turbines have got PLCs up there in the top. So, how secure are they, Chris? Oh, very. I think we should investigate the security of these to see if we can scare people silly, right? Okay, yeah. Now, who are we? We're pen test partners, we're pen testers, well known for doing things like red teaming, Internet of Things. Do you remember my smart doll, Taylor, the swearing kids doll, and my leaky Wi Fi kettle? However, what's unusual about us is we have a number of industrial control systems engineers on the team. Chris, what's your background? So, I used to work for a utilities company in the uh, southwest, large one, for 12 years, and after that, I used to work for a vacuum cleaner manufacturing company. Uh, who are now progressing into making cars as well as vacuum cleaning. And I was their global IT security manager for the corporate side, but also for their manufacturing side in Singapore and Malaysia. So you looked after the security of these environments? Absolutely, yep. In water safety? Yep, water production safety. safety. Okay, so you know what he's doing. So the first thing we need to do when we're looking at industrial controls, you've got to get in. How are you going to get in? Well, probably the easiest way is to use our favourite search engine, Shodan! Finds you everything. Love um, Shodan. You can find industrial controllers just out there on the public internet. An example here we found last week. This is a process controller. We found hundreds of these on the internet with default credentials. And this particular one is there to test and disinfect air conditioning coolant plants. So it's there to check for the build-up of Legionnaire's disease. Default credential, switch it off, everyone dies. That's not so good, is it? Hmm, not so good. So people need to secure their process controllers. But probably the funniest one we've seen in recent years has been this, Chris. So I found a family of Korean cows on the internet. Uh, buttons, I have no idea what any of these things do, but I've got a whole family here of Korean cows and some temperatures. I have no idea what this does, but I found this on the show Oh, it might be a milking machine. What would happen if you turned up to 11? I don't know. Let's see, that might hurt. Yeah, well, that can't be milking, surely. No, oh, too small. Let's not go there. Yeah. So let's get started. So the first place you've got to go in, from Showdown, great. However, we started looking at these devices. These are remote outstation controllers. So they'll have a GSM connection to your outstation and then a VPN that brings that data safely back in. So we went out, we bought some from eBay, the source of all oh, industrial eBay's. control systems, yep. and looked to see how it worked. And we wanted to understand how the VPN was configured and established and how they brought that traffic back. Now this vendor, who we won't name, had some issues four years ago with cross-site scripting and request forgeries. But we went deeper. We wanted to know what else was wrong. Chris, what did you find? So, bear in mind, this is a 4G connection and it is an encrypted VPN connection, so it is for you to be able to remotely manage some kind of industrial control system like these from your corporate head office or wherever, out somewhere in the middle of nowhere that has a phone suit. So, first slight problem, the web page that you use to authenticate against this is HTTP. It's plain text, that is terrible. Okay, not good. That's both on the internet side and also on the LAN side. So it also has cross-site scripting issues, so we could use cross-site scripting to retain or retrieve the credentials, which are just in plain text. So we get out. That's great. So now I'm in. I can now specify some commands, and I've just sent some commands to, the, to this particular one here. And what I've done is I've got the, another username, not mine, another one, but I've got the encrypted password as well. This is not great. The hash one bit at the beginning is a prefix. 
after that, that E section all the way to the equals mark at the end, it's base 64 encoding. And that's not very good because that's reversible. So we did reverse it and it didn't look very great, it looked probably good basically. So we thought, uh, let's have a look at this, a bit more of a look at this. So we set the password to be the smallest thing that the, 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 the device would take, three A's. We changed it to be A, A, B. We noticed that one character here changed. Hold on a minute. So we changed it to A, A, C, A, A, D, etc, etc, etc. We worked out this is basically an XOR encryption. It was per character encryption. Per character encryption. An odd way of doing it. So, using that, I can reveal this password in plain text. Okay, that's useful, that's great. Let's go a bit further. We want more than that. That's it's kids play, we can do that. Let's do something else. So, using exactly the same encryption and using the key that we found for that XOR, what we noticed is that. How do you set up an encrypted VPN tunnel? What are the things that you need to set up an encrypted VPN tunnel? Private key. Private keys, of course. So, those are stored on the device as well. And using CyberChef, decrypt the private keys on this device. Now, what's worse, they're the same on every single one of these devices that are out there. And so I can sit and listen to encrypted traffic by having the private keys for that VPN endpoint. So you bought that device yep. on eBay, and yep. now you've got private keys for all 300,000 devices. Yeah. That's not good, is it? Not really, no. No, so we found this 127 days ago, and we told the vendor, and they said, OK, thanks for that. And then they released new firmware last week. It might have something to do with the fact we were here, I don't know. Right. We agreed not to name, and that was cool, so we didn't want to embarrass them too much. The reason being is people need to have time to apply that patch. But it's not good, is it? These sort of vulnerabilities shouldn't be out there. Fortunately, the vendor's responsible, they fixed it, but it's really, really important that people apply patches not just to their IT infrastructures, but also to their OT infrastructures as well. This is key. So, do you remember 10 years ago, Stuxnet and President Ahmadinejad in his Iranian uranium enrichment <laughs> facility? I can still say it. Still say it. Two more beers I won't be able to. And during a press tour of his secret enrichment facility, it seems that some information got out. I don't know if you see those. On the TV footage, these two devices were noticed. They're differential pressure valves, and they were reporting on the pressures in the centrifuges that were enriching the uranium. Probably the Americans and maybe the Israelis latched onto this, realized they could destabilize the enrichment program by infecting it with a worm that it became known as Stuxnet, and it damaged the centrifuges and set the program back six, perhaps nine months. So, first piece of advice, don't invite the press into your <laughs> industrial <laughs> control facility. Secret. Bad idea. But what we want to talk about next is going from the outstation devices through the switch network for the industrial control system, and then onto the interesting things. And I want to introduce an oil rig. Chris, why have we got an oil rig here? So, we went out uh, last summer and tested this oil rig. For three weeks we got this oil rig. Now, brilliant, amazing experience. What's really key? Thrusters. These are the things that make the oil rig move, or conversely, if you don't want it to move because you're in the middle of drilling, for example, keep it stable. Stable is important. So there were dual redundant fiber up there, down to exactly these type of switches to make them uh, be able to talk. And so the people up in the control room on the top level talk the things down here and stuff that is submerged under water. So you can get a compromise to here, but you still need to get through the switch network to affect the thrusters. And that's when we need to start looking at this device. But one issue <laughs> is if you've got an industrial control security team, it helps if they don't get vertigo. <laughs> so this is me, and this is my colleague Roger. Roger suffers from really bad vertigo. Uh, this is the actual oil rig. There were 176 steps, twice a day up and down those steps, three weeks. That was that was good, that's hard. So you have hard. big thigh muscles. Big thigh. Roger, so poor Roger was in bits at the end of that. Shaking. Like a leaf, poor guy. Anyway, so we're gonna go into the switch and change its configuration by exploiting a vulnerability. So Chris, how did you do it? So, there was a bypass on these particular uh, switches. I'll 
what it does there is it has allowed me to extract all of the concrete file for all of this switch without passing it any authentication whatsoever. There is authentication set on this switch, I've just bypassed it. So, that was cool. What's really interesting is in there, we ignore all the other stuff, and I've just pushed out all the really important bits, is uh, an admin account and a user account with some passwords, hashed passwords. Now, this is really interesting. So we thought we'd look at this a bit more. It's great that the, the, the auth bypass is there, but I want to know what that is. I, I want to know, I'm curious, I want to know what that is. So what we did is took one apart and we connected a JTAG interface to it, sent it through a JTAG interface like this, connected up to GDB and connected up to IDA Pro and we reverse engineered the firmware on there and looked at how this all works. So. I'm not going to go into too much detail because the patch is not quite ready for release yet, but it is soon. What I am going to show you a little bit of redacted information, and this is the config file that I extracted earlier, and I'm going to now reveal the passwords for it. So the admin account password is admin, and then the user account is kind of Now, what's key is this particular word here is not actually the word admin. Uh, and it's generally something else on these devices, but it is the same on every single one of their devices. So we've redacted that information, otherwise you can get to all of them. Yeah, so we disclosed this to the vendor who were really cool. Really good. Cool, cool vendor, these guys. They got right on it, they kept us up to date every week, and um, they came back and said, yeah, that thing you found, it kind of affects everything that we do. Right down, us a bit more time. right down to the core operating system. So, yeah. yeah, which is cool. So we found a backdoor account fundamentally, reverse engineered it using our embedded systems expertise, and that allowed us to take control of the switch modify its config and then allowed us to route through from our endpoint through the switch into some more interesting stuff. So what did we find when we got out there? Well, the next place we need to go is into what we call a remote terminal unit. And I've brought one along. That's pretty heavy. Yeah, this is, why did we have to bring this? I don't know. Well, we borrowed this from an electricity company who were really cool. And these are the boxes that turn the power on and off. So they sit in power stations, in substations, and this is how the power is managed. So we've got a demo which has gone through there, through the switch we compromised, into this device. They usually work over GSM, there's a SIM card slot there, but because it's InfoSec and there's lots of GSM noise, we're doing it over cable. Chris, what, what can you do? What color is the LED at the moment? So this LED here is green, that means the power's on. And you just turned it off. Oh, no. Well, that was oh, hard. Sorry about that. Oops. <laughs> so that's the power off. So the lights are now out. Do you feel lucky? This is quite worrying, isn't it? So we've shown how you can get out from the internet, compromise the switch network, and take out a critical device that looks after our power. That's not so reassuring, is it? Not so great. So before we go any further, do you remember last year we looked at shipping? Do you remember we talked about satcoms on ships and how you could take control of engines and cool stuff. Well, we went out and started looking for some programmable logic controllers from ships. I bought one. It didn't look like this when it arrived, did it? It did actually come like this with a nice presentable cover on it. Uh, but as everybody knows who works at Pentest Partners, never let Ken near any of your gear. He takes it apart. As soon as he gets it, he's there with a screwdriver going, oh, what's this? Uh, and then it doesn't work yet. Yeah, but this one did. The fun thing about this one is, is taking it up, we did find some cool stuff. So Absolutely. These are one of the controllers that do engine controls, engine management, steering, all those cool things you do on ships that are really kind of safety critical. You know, like turning off the engines when you're coming into docking Venice, maybe. Anyway. Yeah. So we bought one, got it on eBay, shipped it in from India, and we found it has no authentication at all. It's one of the most popular maritime controllers with no authentication. Which bit of InfoSec 101 did they miss? And not only that, you can't actually set any authentication on it either. There is no facility within the firmware to set a username or password on it. How, how does that work? So we reported it because we're ethical, remember? And they say visible security controls are sufficient. <laughs> what? Which bit of our demo last year were they not watching where we compromised the vessel over SATCOMs? But even better, if you port scanned it, it voided the warranty. So you couldn't even check the security of it without voiding its warranty. That's nuts. So yeah, um, they're, they're working on that right now. That's a bit of a problem. So we've shown already how you can exploit industrial controllers and switch the lights off. 
but this isn't the only way. We've looked so far at the generation side, so nuclear, power, water, wind turbines, lots of other cool stuff. But we've also, more recently, been looking at the idea of the smart grid, so smart meters, smart solar panel inverters so you can manage electricity demand, and smart car chargers. So we bought one, it's over there, and we spent 750 quid on the smart bit, which is here. Now, I don't know how good you are on hardware. Does anyone recognize that? Anyone? That? Raspberry, Raspberry Pi! Pi. Yes. 750 pounds worth of Raspberry Pi. Wow, it better have some really cool software on it for 750 quid. Um, one of the problems with the Pi, it's great, don't get me wrong, is that you can take the file system off it just by removing the SD card. So you don't need JTAG gear, you don't need I2C, you can just take the file system off. It wasn't encrypted. encrypted. Yeah, it wasn't encrypted. It wasn't even encrypted. An SD card, not even encrypted. Wow, that's mad. So we're thinking this is 750 quid of software. It better be good. Well, um, we ah. didn't even have to reverse engineer it, did we? <laughs> yeah, it took us a long time, this one. Yeah, long we time. used uh, that reverse engineering tool called Notepad. Opened it up. And what did we find in there? So I've redacted this a bit, but we found things like their um, SMTP credentials, so it could report back. We found FTP credentials, so it could report back static. We also found vulnerabilities in their encryption schema, which meant we could remotely turn on and off all the charges. So using that, we could create power spikes. And it doesn't take very much to destabilize the electricity grid on a cold winter's evening at 6 p.m. when everyone's come home and turned the heating and the power on. It doesn't take much to knock the grid out and kill it. It really doesn't. That's a bit scary, isn't it? Absolutely. A bit sobering. How's about a little bit of advice to try and stop this all happening, right? So the, the good news. Well, first things first, please go and check if you've got industrial controllers in your environment. You might be surprised. So yes, if you make stuff, you've probably got a production line. If you've got process controllers, yeah, go and ask who looks after it and find out about security. But lift controllers, gate lines, building management, but go and talk to the people who look after this stuff. Facilities. Go and talk to your facilities department. They will know where this stuff is. They probably will not tell you unless you go and ask them. So yes, go and ask them. Go and talk to them. Go and have a coffee with them or something. They will help you find this stuff. It's really, really key. And then keep it up to date. Check it, make sure it's isolated and it doesn't have vulnerabilities you can use to exploit. And then for a pen test firm, I'm going to do something unusual. I want you to do less pen testing. I want you to do more real world testing. Instead of going pen test bit of the network, that app, that service, look at the business as a whole. Test it like a hacker would so you know if there are vulnerabilities in the hole. And then please don't sit there and wait for a breach. Prepare for it. Get ready, get your playbook ready so you know how to respond fast. Now, that's Chris at the top on Twitter, that's me, that's the blog, it is full of advice to help you industrial industrial controls, with red teaming, with IoT, and even car security. But, to wrap up, if the power's out, because someone's hacked it, the lights are out, your heating's out, you're getting cold, you're gonna need the best giveaway info set. Very, to very important. Warm. Keep your toes warm. Pentest partners, socks. Whee! Best people wear an info set. You like some socks? Hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, do come and have a chat with us. Thank you. Socks. Best people wear an info set. There you go. Get your socks. There you go. Cheers, thank you. There you go. Socks. I'll get some more. Socks. Oh, thank you.